Uh, thank you all for being here. It is wonderful to see you for the first time in the new year. I hope uh, everyone here had some time off and uh, time with family. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure there were many of you, uh, like many of us, who had uh, too little of both. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you. Um, I noticed that in the uh, nomination ceremony in the East Room, the president, as he was speaking about Senator Hagel, never mentioned Israel, he never mentioned Iran. Those have been two of the main criticisms of Senator Hagel. Does the president feel like Hagel needs to address his past comments on Israel and Iran before he can be confirmed, or does he feel like those comments are irrelevant to this process? Well, today the President announced his nominees for Secretary of Defense and uh, the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and he made uh, broad comments about why the two men he nominated uh, are the right people for the jobs. There will be a process in uh, each case where the Senate reviews uh, the nominees. And uh, the President asked the Senate to move quickly because these positions are very important uh, for our national security. And I know uh, Senator Hagel and, and, and John Brennan look forward to that process and, uh, and to fair hearings uh, in both cases. There are, a, a, you know, it is a routine part of this exercise that uh, nominees are asked about their views on various issues. And uh, on the matters you just raised, uh, you know, Senator Hagel has been a staunch supporter of Israel, of Israel, uh, the Israeli-American relationship, of the United States' support for uh, Israel's security throughout his career. Uh, and he has also been, as demonstrated by his record, uh, a supporter of the uh, broad sanctions regime that this president has put into place against Iran, a sanctions regime that is unprecedented and which is uh, recently, as I think last spring, Senator Hagel uh, wrote about favorably and urged uh, Washington as a whole uh, to continue. So uh, I know, uh, I'm sure Senator Hagel looks forward to uh, discussing his record in his uh, nomination hearings. But, but does the president feel like it's important that Hagel clarify some of the statements that he made? Even after the president's announcement today, we saw statements from various lawmakers uh, asking him to clarify what he meant. I, I think that the process will allow for uh, what it always does, which is, uh, you know, a review by the Senate of uh, presidential nominees. Uh, I think that Senator Hagel's record on those issues and so many others demonstrate uh, that he is in sync with the President's policies. And uh, on the first issue, uh, let's be clear. President Obama has, in his administration, overseen uh, the closest, most substantial uh, support for Israel's defense of any administration in history. And that is a judgment that is not just made by me or others in the President's administration. It's a judgment that uh, has been made and expressed by Prime Minister Netanyahu and by Defense Minister Ehud Barak. Uh, and that is a policy that will continue under President Obama with his, with all the members of his national security team. Uh, but again, the process is what it, uh, it's supposed to be, and, and I'm sure that there will be uh, the kind of proceedings that normally take place when nominees for these positions are put forward. The President also said that uh, with national security positions in particular, it's important to not have a gap <coughs> over at Treasury. Secretary Geithner has said that he plans to leave by about January 20th. Given all of the fiscal issues that are coming up and all the deadlines that are coming up, does the President also feel that it's important to not have a gap between when Secretary Geithner leaves and his replacement is confirmed? Well, I have no other announcements to make or updates to give uh, with regards to personnel. I am sure that when uh, the President nominates a successor to Secretary Geithner, he will uh, look forward to speedy consideration by the Senate, but I don't have a timetable for that. So we shouldn't expect something before Geithner leaves on January. I, I have no guidance to give you on the timing. It's very important for any president to have, uh, you know, time and space to consider his or her nominees for these important positions. And when he's ready to make an announcement, he will. Sorry, go ahead. Hey. Okay. The fiscal cliff deal, as, as you know, included a package of tax breaks for businesses worth about $64 billion, uh, including the wind tax credit. 
and Republicans are saying that the President insisted on these, and I'm wondering why, given all of the difficulty reaching that final deal, the President really insisted on including these business tax breaks. Well, you're assuming that uh, what you've been told is correct. I would, I would simply say that it would strain the credulity of everyone in this room to suggest uh, that Republicans did not support or want tax credits for business. Uh, that would truly be turning Washington on its head, and that is not what happened. Uh, the President did support uh, giving certainty to American businesses and consumers by including in the fiscal deal the bipartisan extenders package that the Senate Finance Committee this summer, or summer of 2012, passed 19 to 5. And more than 90 percent of the cost of the extenders package is associated with long-standing provision, provisions rather, in the tax code with clear policy rationale for businesses or individuals, including the R&D tax credit to support domestic job creating research investments, the production tax credit, which you mentioned, uh, which supports clean energy jobs. Uh, if this uh, key support had been allowed to expire, as, as you know, because it was discussed during the campaign, as many as 30, uh, 37,000 clean energy, energy jobs uh, could have been lost. Uh, mortgage debt relief to help homeowners, which protect home homeowners from paying taxes on up to $2 million of forgiven debt, uh, and the list goes on, bonus depreciation. Uh, so again, going back to the first point, uh, this, is, uh, these, this package of uh, tax extenders was supported on a bipartisan basis by uh, the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, the President supported it, but it is, again, uh, you would have to suspend disbelief to uh, uh, accept the premise that Republicans did not. Anne. Thanks, Jay. Is there a moment that the President sat down with Senator Hagel and offered him the job and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk about what kind of shape he would like to see or what direction he'd like to see the Pentagon move in? Well, the President did formally offer Senator Hagel the job, uh, I believe by phone, over the weekend. But the fact is that Senator, uh, Senator Hagel and President Obama uh, have a long relationship that dates back to their service together in the United States Senate. Uh, as the President mentioned today, they traveled together abroad. Uh, and uh, Senator Hagel, after he left the Senate, was co-chair of uh, the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. So they, uh, they have, uh, have had an ongoing conversation about uh, this nation's national security needs uh, and uh, the President's policies in the last four years, which uh, I think is clear that Senator Hagel believes have been the right policies and that he looks forward to helping implement uh, uh, if he is confirmed by the Senate. Front row is kind of docile, but I'll go to Chuck. What, yeah. Um, what did the president's background, uh, right. president's background, what did Chuck Hagel's background give the president confidence that he could run a bureaucracy as big as the Pentagon? Well, among uh, the items on Senator Hagel's uh, rather unique resume is the fact that he was a CEO and a successful one and ran a business, um, and that is uh, one of the many. Uh, attributes that he brings uh, to the job of running, as you say, an institution as large as the Defense Department. Uh, and that's part of a record that, as the President noted today, is really quite remarkable. Uh, here is someone who fought and bled for his country, who, who enlisted as a volunteer uh, to serve and fight in Vietnam, uh, who was awarded the Purple Heart twice, uh, who then served in the VA uh, and as head of USO and then as a United States Senator, and, and since then uh, as an advisor to the President uh, on intelligence matters, on the Intelligence Advisory Board. Uh, this is a, uh, a remarkable career of service uh, in which uh, all of Senator Hagel's many talents are reflected, and, and he will bring those talents to the job. Did anything that was out there trouble the, pres trouble the President enough where he re-interviewed Senator Hagel, like when he saw a report about I, I'm not going to go through the process I mean, how of did he make Senator Hagel answer some, some of these questions? Yeah, I'm not, I, I won't go through the, uh, the, the process that uh, the President uses to select nominees, uh, except that he uh, does so in a very deliberate fashion. Uh, he looks for the very pes the best people for these jobs, uh, both in the national security arena and elsewhere in the administration. Uh, when it comes to Senator Hagel, as I was just saying, he, he has uh, known Senator Hagel for a fairly long time and has worked with him directly both in the Senate and uh, as uh, President. So uh, the President knows his record, he knows Senator Hagel's commitment, and he has full confidence that Senator Hagel will be an excellent Secretary of Defense who uh, will uh, 
look out, as the President said, uh, for uh, those uh, who serve in our armed forces as volunteers, as he did, uh, who uh, implement the policies, the decisions that are made here in Washington, uh, often at such a far remove from the battlefield. And uh, he has great confidence that S Senator Hagel will be an excellent Secretary of Defense. On John Brennan, what makes it different today than four years ago when John Brennan pulled it, pulled, withdrew his name in consideration for the CIA over the, over at the time was thought to be there was going to be uh, that he wasn't ready to answer questions about his role in devising the enhanced and in, in being a part of the uh, enhanced interrogation technique? Well, I'd say two things. One, at the time, uh, Mr. Brennan wrote a letter in which he made clear that he opposed uh, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, and two, for the past four years, John Brennan has served as this President's uh, chief counterterrorism advisor. And it is this President who uh, banned torture as one of his first acts in office. And, and he has implemented that policy and many others uh, with the uh, remarkably capable assistance of John Brennan. And finally, uh, to respond to Secretary, uh, Secretary Sorry, Secretary of Senator. <laughs> Senator McConnell over the weekend said the tax issue is is now done. Does the White House share his view? No. We believe that any further deficit reduction, of which there must be, in the President's view, uh, must uh, be pursued uh, with the same balanced approach that the President has insisted on uh, up to now. Power. I'm not going to. Uh, itemize how it breaks down, but the fact is, as part of the overall $4 trillion deficit reduction package that the President put forward, uh, the re ratio was more like $2 in spending cuts for every $1 in revenue. Going forward now, now that this well, is Well, again, you'd have to break down the numbers and look at it, and I'm not going to prejudge uh, any proposals that might come forward. But one of the things you heard the President of the United States say uh, on New Year's Day, when this uh, fiscal cliff uh, challenge was resolved, is that the agreement enshrined the principle that we must have balance as we move forward in our deficit reduction. In the spending cuts that were part of the fiscal cliff deal, uh, they were paid for in a balanced way with both, uh, or rather the, the, buy, the buy down of the sequester was paid for in a balanced way with both uh, roughly 50 percent spending cuts and 50 percent revenue. And that is an approach the President, balance anyway, is an approach the President believes is very important to continue. And, uh, you know, when members of Congress suggest that revenues are now somehow not part of the equation, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, because as I s stood here and discussed with you uh, the various proposals going back and forth during the fiscal cliff negotiations when the President was seeking in negotiations with Speaker Boehner a big deal, uh, one that would address our long-term fiscal challenges through uh, broader deficit reduction, the Speaker put on the table what he claimed was an $800 billion revenue pr proposal made up entirely of uh, the closure of loopholes and the capping of deductions, tax reform. Now, either that was good policy that they no longer support or Republicans also believe, as the President does, that through tax reform, uh, we can achieve uh, an improved tax. Do you think the Republicans tax in taxing? Well, again, I would, I, would ask, I would ask you what about that $800 billion proposal was uh, okay then, it's not okay now. And the President believes, as Republicans have said they believe, that we need to reform our tax code and that there are uh, loopholes that are crying out to be closed that uh, no longer serve the country if they ever did, and that there are ways of capping deductions and uh, reforming our tax code uh, that can produce more revenue in a fair way that, uh, again, does not burden the middle class but asks the wealthiest to pay more. Jay? Yes. Since you talked about the top conversation with Boehner, at that last stage was $1.2 trillion of the revenue the President put on the table in the last conversation with Boehner. Does mm -hmm. that mean the President is looking for ballpark six billion, six hundred billion more in the tax reform revenue? I would prefer not to get into the negotiations for how we uh, eliminate the sequester, which uh, the President obviously is interested in doing, uh, from this podium today. But it is clear from the proposals the President put forward dating back to uh, his uh, submission to the Super Committee, through his budget proposals, and through the negotiations with Speaker Boehner, what his principles are, 
uh, where he believes we can uh, appropriately reform our tax code and produce more revenue and the, and the balance that we need to uh, inform us as we make the kind of spending cuts that are necessary for broader deficit reduction. Uh, but uh, the fact is, uh, going back to Chuck's question, is that we know that balance is the way to go here. It is, what, it is the uh, path that the public supports and it, uh, it is inconceivable to the President and I would think to many of you that the Republicans want to, as we approach uh, the coming months, have as a basic position that uh, what we really need to do is, uh, for example, going back to some of their previous proposals like the Ryan budget, uh, voucherize Medicare or uh, slash benefits for seniors uh, without asking the wealthy to do any more. I don't think that's a position that is plausible to take uh, and it's certainly not a position the President supports. Is he adamantly opposed to a revenue neutral tax reform approach <coughs> and would he veto a bill that was operating on that premise? Uh, well, you're, you're getting way ahead of uh, any process that's in place now. He is uh, well, opposed. Well, well, let me just, on the <laughs> first. Neutrality is their opening bid on but, tax reform. Well, I, I appreciated this, their opening bid, but for some reason it was viable uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, to find $800 billion in revenue through closed loopholes and uh, cap deductions that presumably aren't good for the economy. Uh, and the President believes that tax reform uh, can and should uh, produce more revenue uh, because balance is essential as we achieve further deficit reduction because it is not the President's position, as he made clear from this podium uh, just last week, uh, that we will reduce our deficit going forward uh, simply by asking seniors or middle class families or uh, parents with kids in college to bear the burden solely. How alarmed is the President at the tepid reaction of Senate Democrats to <laughs> Senator Hagel's nomination? The President believes that when the Senate considers the totality of Senator Hagel's career, uh, that they will confirm him as his, the next Secretary of Defense. The, Senator, the Senator's record is exemplary, uh, both in uniform and uh, in the private sector and as a United States Senator and as an advisor on intelligence matters, matters to the President. And I know that Senator Hagel looks forward to discussing that record with the Senate. And, uh, you know, I, I won't uh, bore you or uh, uh, tie up too much of your time by reading, reading the uh, number of endorsements that Senator Hagel's nomination has already received from a variety of quarters. Uh, but they are numerous and we expect that more will come. Is it your position that when Hagel was skeptical of sanctions on Iran in 2006, 2005, called for direct negotiations with Hezbollah, all this stuff was that was then and this is now, it just isn't relevant to well, the those are, those are Those are, uh, I think, uh, descriptions of the positions that are slightly uh, skewed by the current debate. They're not part of the fact is on sanctions, for example, the Senator Hagel uh, supported uh, a, an aggressive sanctions regime against Iran, and he, as recently as last year, wrote about the need to continue to isolate and pressure Iran through sanctions. I mean, their roll call was um, in 2005, 2006. Again, but there, the there are there there is the approach that President Obama has taken, which has been vastly more effective and which has been multilateral in nature be, and and therefore more effective to Iran. And there are individual votes that you can isolate and say uh, represent the whole, which they do not. The fact is, Senator Hagel supports. Uh, a sanctions regime against Iran, and as Secretary of Defense, he will uh, aggressively uh, implement the President's policies, including uh, his uh, very aggressive approach to sanctioning Iran for its failure to meet its international obligations with regards to its nuclear program. Uh, so uh, again, the pres the Senator Hagel's record is exemplary on all of these issues, and uh, he will I'm sure when he has the opportunity to uh, have a confirmation hearing, be asked a lot of questions about what his views are on policies. Fundamentally, what's important to remember is that members of this President's national security team, just like members of uh, his broader team, uh, are hired and do the work of implement for and do the work of implementing the President's policies. And when it comes to uh, Israel, to the Middle East, to Hezbollah, to Hamas, uh, to Iran, this President's policies are very clear. And uh, Senator Hagel uh, will, as Secretary of Defense, uh, carry out those policies, just as John Brennan will as Director of the CIA, and uh, as uh, other members of the President's team have and will going forward, including, uh, as you know, Secretary Gates, one of 
uh, this president's secretaries of defense, who just uh, a few moments ago uh, expressed his admiration for Senator Hagel and his desire that Senator Hagel be confirmed as Secretary of Defense. In, in light of that, what do you make of Senator Lindsey Graham's uh, assertion that the Hagel nomination is an in-your-face nomination that suggests an in-your-face second term? Well, it's just, I, you know, again, I'm not going to get into an, uh, uh, a rebuttal of every stray comment made by uh, members of Congress. The fact of the matter is Senator Hagel's record uh, is exemplary. He fought for his country in uniform as an enlisted member uh, of the armed services in Vietnam. He uh, served his country in the United States Senate, and um, it is rather remarkable to hear uh, some of uh, the critics out there uh, question Senator Hagel uh, and whether or not he should have this position when you look back at what those very same members of the Senate said uh, effusively in praise of Senator Hagel just a few years ago. Uh, he is uh, the same man today, the same patriot today, uh, the same uh, intellect today that he was then. Uh, and uh, we agree with, for example, Senator McCain, who said uh, uh, not too many years ago that uh, Chuck Hagel would be an excellent Secretary of State. Uh, the President happens to believe that he would be an excellent Secretary of Defense. On another matter. Yeah. Um, the Vice President has been charged with um, what we are to understand will be a broad approach to dealing with the problem of gun violence. Senator McConnell says he doesn't want to talk about anything but, but uh, fiscal matters for the next few years. Does that mean we shouldn't expect uh, any movement, uh, any recommendations from the Vice President uh, uh, over the next few months? I'm sorry, I said years, I meant months. Mm -hmm. um, well, I. With, with respect to Senator McConnell, I think the President will move forward with his agenda uh, in, uh, uh, in a timely fashion, and that includes uh, uh, the work that Vice President Biden is doing on uh, the effort to examine uh, measures that we can take to address the problem of gun violence in this country. I think that many Americans, if not most, I believe most Americans would uh, disagree with the idea that in the wake of what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, that we should put off any action uh, on the issue of gun violence. I think that sentiment would be uh, met with surprise by uh, uh, the vast majority of the American people who don't watch uh, the Sunday shows, especially on the Sunday after New Year's Day. Uh, but uh, it's certainly not a sentiment the President supports. And talk to me about a broad effort as opposed to something that deals with strictly well, with I can gun cite, laws. I can cite the President uh, on several occasions where he talked about uh, the fact that uh, issues that, uh, that, that, that approaches that address access to guns, including legislation like the assault weapons ban or legislation that would ban high capacity gun clips or legislation that would uh, close the many loopholes in our background check system, uh, are only a while very important and he supports congressional actions right away uh, on those matters, are only part of the problem and only address part of the problem. And he believes that issues of mental health, issues of education, uh, for example, are uh, part of this uh, problem and need to be addressed as part of the effort that Vice President Biden is undertaking. Alexis. Jerry, um, and then. All the Hill senators had greeted um, or had criticized Susan Rice, who was not nominated for a, a new position, in a way that uh, prompted the President to suggest that he, in <coughs> fact, she was being used as a proxy, that they were actually criticizing him. Does the President listen to the criticism of Senator Hagel in much the same way, believing that the criticism is more aimed at him than it is at Senator Hagel? Well, I, I will reject the uh, temptation to compare one to the other. I will simply say that uh, the President believes very firmly, as you heard him uh, just moments ago, say that Senator Hagel uh, will make, if confirmed, an excellent Secretary of Defense, that his record is exemplary. Uh, and uh, unique in that, as the, Sen uh, as the President said, Senator Hagel uh, would be uh, the first Vietnam veteran uh, to run the Defense Department, the first enlisted uh, person to run the Defense Department. And, uh, and, and with that, he would bring uh, a keen understanding of and appreciation for the men and women who serve uh, throughout our armed forces. So he looks forward to a speedy consideration by the Senate and uh, believes that Senator Hagel's record will um, convince the Senate uh, to uh, confirm him as the next Secretary of Defense. Can I a follow-up on that? Um, 
Major's question about the process towards sequestration. For those who think that the President maybe learned from the process he just went through on the fiscal cliff that he will not be dealing directly with Speaker Boehner, does the President, can you just clarify, does he fully intend to have continuing conversations directly with the Speaker to negotiate with him directly? Well, the, the President believes that as part of our system of government, the executive branch engages with and negotiates with the legislative branch, and that will continue on a range of issues, not just economic and fiscal matters. Uh, and the President, as he said, is very open to compromise uh, on a range of issues when it comes to address addressing our fiscal challenges and uh, putting in place policies that help our economy grow and uh, continue to create jobs. He will not negotiate over Congress's responsibility to pay the bills that Congress has incurred. As you know, as a veteran reporter here in Washington, uh, a president cannot by himself or herself spend a single dollar. Congress passes the laws, Congress appropriates the funds, Congress racks up the bills, and Congress must pay the bills. And it is simply inappropriate uh, and extremely dangerous to suggest that uh, in the name of a political agenda, uh, we would default, for example, on our obligations to pay our bills. That is Congress's responsibility, and the President will not negotiate with Congress over Congress's responsibility to pay its bills. Jay, the, the Speaker prior to Glenn, how are you? Hi, Jay. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Where's your hat? Uh, it's down there. <laughs> uh, I'll put it on for you later. <laughs> uh, it's, a little, it's a little, you know, the lights are bright, they reflect, and it's. <laughs> I apologize. No, it is actually. I, I, I remind my son of that periodically. Thank you for that. I don't want to read that. But the uh, the speaker uh, the speaker apparently said explicitly to his own conference prior to his reelection as speaker last week that he does not want to negotiate directly with the president anymore. Do you think that's appropriate? And, and what's the president's response? No, this is not personal, and this is about putting in place the policies that are best for the country. That's how the President looks at it. There is no question that uh, President Obama, in the course of his four years in office, has uh, learned a great deal about uh, how to work with Congress and how to enlist public support uh, on behalf of policies that are very important to uh, the lives of everyday Americans across the country. And as we've discussed in recent months, the President will continue to make the case to the American people uh, for uh, the policies that he believes are right, and uh, even as he works with and negotiates with Congress uh, on matters of uh, legislative importance. So, you know, I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not sure, I didn't, I only heard about this uh, indirectly, I didn't obviously have this conversation directly with the speaker or even read the article that you're talking about, but I did hear this. I think, look, it is incumbent upon the leaders in Washington to continue to work together uh, to get the, uh, necessary work done to advance the economy, continue, have it continue to create jobs, and to uh, ensure that uh, we're doing everything possible to make America safe. And that includes confirming, for example, presidential nominees for national security is posts. To, I mean, is he committed to pressing that with Speaker Boehner? Will he try to talk to well, Boehner? I, even if Boehner what, what I think of the distinction I'm trying to make here in answer uh, to Alexis's question is that he is, as he said from here, uh, eager to and willing to compromise uh, in order to achieve uh, policies that advance our economic growth uh, and uh, help, it create job help the economy create jobs and bring down our deficit in a responsible and balanced way. Uh, he will continue to do that. For and we have, as a result of the fiscal cliff, uh, two more months to deal with the so-called sequester, and that's something that the President will obviously uh, be addressing. What he will not do, as he has made clear, is negotiate with Congress over Congress's sole responsibility to pay the bills that Congress has already incurred. Uh, nobody forced Congress to rack up the bills that it incurred, and uh, it is an abdication of responsibility to say that uh, we're going to let the country default and cause global economic calamity uh, simply because uh, we're not getting what we want in terms of our ideological agenda. The President's not going to participate in that, and I, I w would uh, um, remind you of the, the damage caused to our economy by 
the approach that House Republicans took on this matter just uh, in the summer of 2011. As a result of their flirtation with default, um, uh, the stock market plummeted. The, the Dow fell 7 percent, or almost 900 points, in late July and early August of 2011. The United States was downgraded, and the Dow fell another 10 percent, or 1,100 points, after the S&P downgraded the United States. Consumer confidence plummeted to its lowest point since the financial crisis in 2008. Uncertainty for businesses froze hiring. Widespread uncertainty for middle class families was created and caused, and job figures, job growth in August of 2011 was the lowest of any month in our economic recovery. And that is what you get when you play games with the full faith and credit of the United States. We don't expect and certainly don't hope, uh, or certainly hope that the President, uh, that the Congress does not engage in that kind of activity. Again, Mr. Zeleny and then CNN. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Back to you, Senator Hagel, for a second. In his first interview uh, today, um, he said that he was, quote, hanging out there in uh, no man's land, unable to respond to charges and falsehoods and distortions against him. I'm wondering if you could walk through what specific groups, outside groups, outside the Senate, has Jack Lew and other administration officials been reaching out to in hopes of um, smoothing this nomination? Well, I, uh, I, I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity, but I'll pass on it. Uh, obviously, the, the, broadly speaking, the White House is reaching out to um, a number of uh, groups and individuals uh, with regards to this nomination and others, and will continue to do so uh, in making the case for uh, these individuals. Uh, but uh, it, it, as far as the, the initial part of your question, it is certainly an unfortunate reality that has become the norm here in Washington that even when uh, names are bandied about in the press as possible nominees, that uh, uh, a process begins where uh, critics uh, jump all over them, and uh, you know that's just part of well, one of the reasons why uh, uh, Washington has become a, a more fractious uh, place. But th again, the president looks forward to Senate consideration of his nominees that he announced today. He uh, believes that the Senate will confirm both uh, Senator Hagel uh, and John Brennan uh, to those positions. Uh, and uh, in each case, as the president said, these are uniquely qualified individuals for the offices uh, that they will hold if confirmed. Is the White House enlisting other outside people, though, uh, to uh, help with these groups? No, I no. I think that. Well, I, I will simply say that we have conversations with individuals all the time about uh, and groups about our policy proposals and uh, nominees uh, for high, higher office. But I don't have anything specific to report to you, and, and there's nothing unusual about uh, that process for either this administration or its predecessors, Brianna. Jay, the recent personnel announcements that we've heard have all been men. I'm wondering how important it is to President Obama to have women in prominent roles in his new cabinet. Well, I appreciate the question. Uh, the President does believe that diversity is very important. Uh, and he also believes that picking the absolute right person for each job is very important. And the nominees he announced today represent uh, that uh, principle in, in that he believes Senator Hagel and John Brennan are the right individuals for the jobs. Uh, to which they have been nominated. Uh, I would remind you that uh, as part of President Obama's uh, national security team, uh, we have uh, Secretary Clinton, who after four years is leaving office. We have Secretary Napolitano, uh, who continues as Homeland Security uh, Secretary. We have Ambassador Susan Rice, who has indicated that she will be staying on uh, in New York as uh, the U.S. representative to the United Nations, a cabinet-level position. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, obviously other uh, remarkably capable women uh, in uh, positions of high office in this administration and will continue to be. But presumably, I mean, some of them will obviously leave over time, and I'm wondering, in terms of having a re replacement, for instance, with Secretary Clinton leaving, mm -hmm. uh, do you think... Well, I think that any suggestion that Secretary Clinton was chosen because of her gender would be rejected by Secretary Clinton and others, and any suggestion that, uh, you know, nominees not be chosen for their qualifications would be rejected by uh, everyone whose interest is in, as the president's is, uh, the very finding the very best people for each job. Uh, and that's what he's done today, and that's what he'll continue to do. And, and, and he, in that process, insists on uh, diversity uh, on the, uh, the lists that he considers for uh, the job, because he believes that in uh, casting a, a, a broader net, you, you, you increase the excellence of the pool. 
uh, of potential nominees for these positions. But in the end, he'll make the choice that he believes is best uh, for uh, the United States. In this case, that would be Secretary Hagel or Senator Hagel for Secretary of Defense and John Brennan for Director of the CIA. And, and on the Biden group, when will we hear from the Biden group? I think the President has indicated that he uh, wants uh, the effort led by Vice President Biden to report to him uh, with dispatch, but I don't have a, a timeline to give you. Uh, the President has already urged Congress, uh, when it comes back to work, uh, to uh, take up initiatives, uh, legislation to ban assault weapons, to ban high-capacity magazines, and to uh, uh, improve our background check system because it does have loopholes. The so-called the so gun show uh, loophole is a problem and that he thinks that Congress uh, can and should address. Um, as for the other aspects of what uh, the President will recommend, I'll leave it to him to announce. It seems, late, or it seems January was sort of the absolute last time that he wants for recommendations, and there have been some reports that there will be listening sessions. I'm wondering, if, is there time? <laughs> well, that, or, or, or it is January 7th, and I, uh, it would, uh, uh, will there be, it would be a disservice to the month of January to assume that it was over uh, a one weekend. <laughs> Uh, so I would uh, ask you to stay tuned. I, I just don't have any uh, <laughs> December. Yes. Uh, Will there be a chance for people to weigh in in listening? You know, I, I just don't have any more information for you. I know that the, the the vice president is leading a process that is very inclusive, that is including, as I think has been reported, uh, conversations with uh, many stakeholders from uh, who have a keen interest in this issue, and that will continue to be the case. <laughs> Roger Ryan. Thank you. And then um, Mr. Nakamura. Uh, Jay, can you tell us who the Sherpas are for each of the nominees today? I, I don't have uh, Sherpas for you. I think a Sherpa is uh, uh, commonly associated with Supreme Court nominees. I don't know that uh, there are uh, such beings in this case. The, the um, Senator Hagel and, and Mr. Brennan will be assisted uh, as they uh, go through the process of a confirmation in the Senate by a number of people, but I don't have individuals to provide to you. Uh, the Senate Chairman will, of course, set the dates on that, but do you have commitments for them to set an early date as soon as they return on the 22nd or so? The President, uh, as you heard him earlier today say, hopes that the Senate will uh, take up these uh, nominations as, as well as the nomination of Senator Kerry for Secretary of State uh, as soon as possible because of the importance of filling these uh, positions quickly. Uh, importance to our national security, but I don't have a, a date certain for you, and obviously we defer uh, to the relevant committees. Dave. You said, uh, Jay, just to follow up on Brianna's question, you talked just a minute ago about when the President believes in diversity, insists mm -hmm. on diversity, and that he casts a broad net when he's talking about, you know, looking for candidates for to serve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during the campaign, and, and uh, Mitt Romney was sort of ridiculed for saying that he, he wanted a binder full of women to make decisions on cabinet mm -hmm. members. What do you mean by the President's is insisting on diversity and cast this broad net. Does he interview people like Michelle Flournoy for defense job to make sure that he's really hearing from women, from other minorities, and, and specifically this job and other jobs? And, you know, does he, or does he insist on other ways to find qualified candidates? To he, again, without, without addressing any specific nomination process, I would say that the answer is yes. He uh, speaks with numerous potential candidates for uh, various positions. Uh, and uh, diverse uh, candidates. He selects, as I think uh, the uh, office holders in his first administration and first cabinet demonstrates, he, he selects uh, uh, men and women who he believes are uh, the right individuals for the jobs uh, to which they've been appointed. And, uh, you know, that continues to be his uh, process. It's not a uh, it's, not a, it's not uniform, it's a broad sentiment, and he believes that the country is served by um, a process that uh, does seek out the uh, uh, diverse talent in this country for different positions. John Christopher. These early nominations, Sen the Senators Kerry and Hankel and Mr. Brennan, does this prove that the President's second term agenda will be really focused in terms of priority? on national security and foreign policy? It proves that the President, as he said today, uh, considers the security of the United States and the American people his highest priority and responsibility. And that is why he has 
asked uh, individuals of such uh, talent and records of service as John Brennan and Senator Kerry and Senator Hagel uh, to serve in the positions that they've been uh, nominated for. Uh, broadly speaking, as he has said repeatedly, his policy priority, uh, I mean there are obviously many, but his top priority continues to be having our economy grow, having it create jobs, giving security to the middle class uh, and building a foundation for future economic growth in the 21st century that will allow for future generations to uh, enjoy the opportunity and promise of America that uh, previous generations, including the President's own, have enjoyed. Uh, that remains his top priority. Uh, but there is no question that, as he said today, that his primary responsibility, as he views it, uh, is the safety and security of the United States and its people basically intertwined? I, mean, I think it, the answer to that is absolutely yes, because uh, that is the responsibility of every president, uh, and uh, one that this president takes very seriously. Yes? Um, I'm going back to the debt ceiling debate for a minute. The Bipartisan Policy Center issued a report today that said the government would actually run out of uh, money prior to what we have normally talked about, so as early as February 15th. So I was wondering if the administration was thinking about asking the IRS to, to postpone uh, refunds for people, or also were you all thinking about issuing an order about which creditors would be paid first? This well, as we know, the Treasury Department uh, handles questions like these and has put out uh, information about it, including in a letter at the end of the year uh, about uh, both uh, the estimates of, as to when the debt ceiling would be reached and to the measures that the Treasury Department has in the past and is now taking uh, uh, with regards to that matter. But I would refer you for the questions that you asked to the Treasury Department. Thank George. You. Uh, you keep saying the President won't negotiate on the debt ceiling. At the risk of sounding naive, how, do, how does that work practically? If, if the leaders of Congress tell them they don't have the votes to uh, raise the ceiling, does he just say, no, I'm not going to talk about that? Well, the, the President believes that members of Congress were elected uh, to serve their constituents and as one of their essential responsibilities to uh, ensure that uh, they do no harm in Congress to this economy and to uh, the livelihoods of average Americans. Flirting with default or, even worse, allowing default would be a violation of those primary responsibilities. And again, George, I can't be more clear. These are bills that Congress racked up. If Congress felt that they should not be paying these bills or that uh, there should be less spending and less borrowing, then they should have passed different legislation that appropriated funds. It is not uh, the President's responsibility to pass legislation to raise the debt ceiling. It is Congress's responsibility. And he will not engage in a negotiation with Congress uh, that as some advocates of this themselves have described as a hostage situation, a hostage situation that would result, as it did in the summer of 2011, in great harm to this economy, in great harm to American businesses, in great harm uh, to uh, average Americans. So it's just not the right thing to do. I think that there will be a, if, if we were to travel down that road for any time, uh, a great deal of uh, unanimity behind the idea that it's a, it's a terrible proposition to flirt with default or to allow default. And let, let me remind you that if the position of Republicans in Congress will be that uh, your choice America is between default and therefore economic chaos on the one hand or voucherizing Medicare or slashing benefits for seniors, uh, the American people are going to say no. In both instances, this is not the right way to do things in this country. You have to heed to your responsibilities here, and that includes paying for the bills that you racked up. This has nothing to do with future spending. This has to do with spending that has already been incurred, and it is Congress's responsibility to pay its bills. George, when you get a credit card bill, uh, you pay it, and if you don't, you get penalized. And in the case of not paying your bills, uh, when you're the United States of America, when you're in the United States Congress, the penalty is uh, both real in financial terms and severe for the economy and for the American people. 
The President won't negotiate with Congress over Congress's responsibility to pay its own bills. Thank you all. The President signed all of those spending bills. So why doesn't he share responsibility? Well, he did not sign all of those spending bills. The President's been in office for four years. And in fact, a huge portion of our current all deficit problem were racked up under uh, previous administrations. And it is often forgotten by Republican leaders that this is the case, uh, that some of the very Republican leaders in office now who uh, claim as their objective deficit reduction, primary obje objective, presided over uh, enormous budget busting legislation uh, in the previous administration. It is also often forgotten that the only uh, president uh, in uh, uh, our, our times here in Washington to have balanced the budget was President Bill Clinton. And uh, he passed to his successor uh, surpluses. Uh, and it was uh, actions taken by Congress in the previous decade and uh, the administration in office at the time uh, that eliminated those surpluses and turned them into the largest deficits of our lifetimes at the time. So uh, the President takes his responsibility very seriously. But when it comes to bills that Congress has, Congress has passed and uh, needs to pay, they ought to take their responsibility seriously and pay those bills. Thank you. Is the President going to watch a game tonight? Uh, I haven't asked him.